Welcome to Christ Center Community on Upper Caswell Lake. May our time together, learning about God and His expectations of us, be a mighty blessing to you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for so clearly stating your expectations of us with respect to loving you and loving our neighbors. Thank you for sending your Son into the world to be an example for us. Thank you for the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in those who believe in your Son to provide guidance to us and to convict us when we are not following Jesus' example. May the Holy Spirit use this message to help us recognize when we have not lived up to your expectations of us, that we might repent and grow in the likeness of Christ, such that others we meet might see Christ in us always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank goodness God is a heart for outcast, for that is who we were before we asked Jesus to be our Savior. Sin got Adam and Eve kicked out of Eden. Our sin separated us from God. Thankfully, God the Father, the ultimate source of salvation, provided a way to save us and bring us back into relationship with Him. Jesus was the means. Thankfully, 2,028 years ago, Jesus was willing and came to save us. Thankfully, he selected and trained disciples to go all to all the nations to proclaim the message of salvation and to be his witnesses to the world. Thankfully, that message of salvation was handed down to us in the gospel according to Luke. Yes, thank goodness, God has a heart for the outcast. The question is, do you have a heart for the outcast? Those who are poor and different from yourself? Today, we're starting a sermon series titled, The Gospel for the Outcast, during which we will be discussing in part six parables Luke included in what is sometimes called the Gospel for the Outcast section of the Gospel according to Luke, all of which have a common theme, insiders becoming outsiders. Today, we will be discussing the parable of the Good Samaritan. With that in mind, let us consider our text for today, Luke 10, verses 25 through 37. Before reading the text, please close your eyes for a moment. Now step back in time 2,000 years and see if you can envision yourself walking the 17-mile dirt road from Jerusalem to Jericho. The terrain is rocky. The narrow road winds through the desert. It gradually declines over 3,400 feet. You begin to enter the pass of Aldomin, which is known for being dangerous. It has caves on both sides. Now that we have a visual image in our minds of the geographic context of our text for today, let us consider the actual text. And a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance a priest was going down on that road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also. When he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, who was on a journey, came upon him. 
And when he saw him, he felt compassion and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his beast and he brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him. And whatever more you spend when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, The one who showed mercy toward him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do the same. The context of our text for today within the gospel according to Luke as well as the geographic and cultural context, is very important if one is to understand it fully and if one is to fulfill God's expectation to love your neighbor as yourself. With respect to our text for today's context within Luke's gospel, Jesus is preparing his disciples to fulfill their role in God's plan. In this particular episode, Jesus is able to continue to instruct his disciples as well as to respond to the lawyer. Specifically, it enabled Jesus to build on his previous teaching with respect to treating others the same way you want them to treat you, recorded in Luke 6, verse 31. With respect to our text for today's geographic context, It takes place on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, which is within the southern kingdom of Judah, or within the lawyer's home turf or culture. A man was walking down this narrow road, which winds through the desert and gradually declines over 3,400 feet. He enters the pass of Aldomim, which has caves on both sides, and is known for being dangerous, where sure enough, He is attacked by robbers. Jesus' disciples and the lawyer most likely had walked that same road and could relate to the trepidation the man felt as he entered that pass. As such, Jesus had captured their attention. He also challenged their cultural understanding or biases through the use of three key players in the parable. Three key players they could relate to for their culture had taught them how to think, just as our culture has taught us how to think. These key players being a priest and a Levite, insiders in the Jewish culture of the time, and a Samaritan, an outsider. Through the use of both a geographic and cultural context, they could relate to Jesus illustrated God's expectation with respect to loving one's neighbor. Such was also the context in which the author Luke brings to light his theme of reversal and that the gospel message is for all people. Jesus' expectations are the same for his disciples of today, and the episode is meant to prepare us to fulfill our role in God's plan. The geographic context for those of us who live in rural Alaska is certainly different from that on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. But it doesn't take much stretch of the imagination to relate to the geographic context. For the risk faced here in the winter from mechanical failure or road hazard could be life-threatening as well and could require one to assist one's neighbor. The question is, How would you respond? Would your response be that of the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan? For each justified his response in his own mind. Let us look first to the response of the priest. If you recall, the Old Testament law was handed down by God through Moses to the Israelites, whereby Aaron, Moses' brother, was the first High priest. When the priest in question saw the man, he passed by on the other side of the road, since the road from Jerusalem to Jericho is within the historic southern kingdom of Judah. Most likely, the injured man was Jewish. However, it appears the priest wasn't taking any chances, saying to himself, eh, he's probably not one of us anyway. 
he is most likely a non-resident alien. His response was symbolic of the definition of one's neighbor under the Old Testament law spelled out in Leviticus 19, verse 18, whereby one's neighbor is a fellow Israelite and is extended to the resident aliens as well in Leviticus 19, verse 34. In our present day context, living by the letter of that law with respect to the definition of one's neighbor, it would look like something like this. Each year, Linda and Larry routinely invite all the church members who have no place to go for Thanksgiving to their home for Thanksgiving dinner. This particular year, when Linda calls to invite church member Bill and Linda to Thanksgiving, she discovers their adult daughter, son-in-law, plus their two children, have unexpectedly moved in with them from the lower 48 states. They're not Christians, but she invites them as well because they are now living with Bill and Linda. That is, under the letter of the law, she invites the in-group as well as the resident aliens. Which brings us to the response of the Levite. When the Levite saw the man, he too passed by on the other side of the road. Like the priest, he was a member of the tribe of Levi. His role was to provide assistance to the priests in the worship in the Jewish temple. The duties of the priests and the Levites were spelled out in Numbers chapter 18, which did not include providing assistance to wayward travelers, apparently. He too wasn't taking any chances, saying to himself, he's probably not one of us anyway. He could even be a Samaritan. His response was symbolic of how the mixed situation in Palestine in the first century resulted in the non-Jewish populace appearing not as innocent resident aliens, but for the most part as an expression of the hated state of foreign domination. The sense of group loyalty and loyalty to God found expression in firm boundaries in defining one as a neighbor. In our present day context, living by group loyalty with respect to definition of one's neighbor will look something like this. As we said before, each year, Linda and Larry routinely invite, invite all the church members who have no place to go for Thanksgiving to their home for Thanksgiving dinner. This particular year, when Linda calls to invite church members, Bill and Linda, to Thanksgiving, she discovers their adult daughter, son-in-law, plus her two children, have unexpectedly moved in with them from the lower 48 states. Since they are not Christians, she does not invite these outsiders. That is, she allowed her prejudice to stand in the way of obeying the letter of the law. Which brings us to the response of the Samaritan. The Samaritan wasn't even traveling on his own turf. He was traveling in a land where there was significant prejudice towards Samaritans. The hostility between the Jews and the Samaritans dating back to the origin of the Samaritans in 2 Kings 17, verses 24 through 42, or to 722 B.C. He could have easily justified not helping the injured man by saying to himself, he wouldn't want me to help him anyway. He wouldn't even want me to touch him for that matter. But yet, it was the response of this hated Samaritan towards this injured traveler with no regard for his religious tradition or culture affiliation that defines the word neighbor in the eyes of Jesus. All that mattered to the Samaritan was that the man needed help. Let me repeat that, that the man needed help. In our present day context, living by this definition of neighbor would look something like this. In the 2015 film, Do You Believe?, emergency medical technician, Bobby, led a dying man who was a professed atheist to Christ just before he died. 
By the time his wife arrived, her husband had died. She was enraged by Bobby's actions with respect to leading her husband to Christ. And a court action ensued. Her attorney, a rather arrogant woman, was antagonistic towards Bobby outside the courtroom and cost him his job inside the courtroom. On her way home, she got in a life-threatening traffic accident. And even though Bobby was no longer an emergency medical technician, he saved her life. She had a hard time understanding why Bobby would do that. But Jesus wouldn't, for Bobby fulfilled Jesus' expectations. Bobby was loving his neighbor as himself. Now that we have gained an understanding of our text for today, let us consider its application in our daily lives, beginning with the question, what does you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind look like an application? We can turn to Jesus for the answer to that question. No words sum up well the passion for God, the intimacy with God through prayer, and the fidelity to God through faithfulness and obedience that were the hallmarks of Jesus' own life and to which he called others. Your heart denotes response to God from the innermost personal center of your being. Your life or soul conjures up the role of the life force that energizes you. Your strength introduces the element of energetic physical action. Your mind signals the inclusion of the thinking and planning processes. The challenge is to have a comprehensive engagement with God with the total capacity of all of your faculties. Love that responds from the heart responds with the hands, that is, it bears fruit. What does loving thy neighbor as yourself look like in application? It is from the perspective of the ditch where one lies helpless and battered and in desperate need of help that one should reflect upon the question, who is my neighbor? Then we will know how wide the reach neighbor love should extend when we are in a position to be handing out favors. We will recognize we should be a neighbor by having compassion and for extending mercy and love to all. Time and sacrifice could well be involved. The issue is not to define who the neighbor is or to seek to do the minimum we can do. It is simply a call to extend God's mercy and love to all, thereby being a neighbor which is what Jesus expects of his disciples. What does loving your neighbor look like in application? It is making everyone who walks through the door of the church feel welcome, showing interest in them, listening to them. It's being patient with the children in whom God has given us the privilege of planting seeds of faith. It means stopping and asking people if you can be of assistance if they are stopped on a road in your community. It means treating others the way you want them to treat you. In our text for today, the author Luke reveals that authentic discipleship is defined by sacrificial love of others, regardless of their culture or ethnic origin. The big idea being that Jesus expects his disciples to extend mercy and love to all, thereby being a neighbor. Jesus expects his disciples to make salvation available to all people. Thus, understanding who one's neighbor is, is critical to the success of our mission as disciples of Christ. So the question I leave you with to reflect on today and the days ahead is, as a disciple of Christ, am I extending mercy and love to all, especially the poor and outcast, or am I being discriminatory? Let us pray. Father God, we humble ourselves before you. We ask that you forgive us for all those times we have not reflected your love toward others in our actions and our words because of ethnic, 
cultural, economic, religious, age, or sexual differences. That is, when we have made others feel like they're not worthy of our love. Please help us love others as we love ourselves. Please help us love as Jesus loved. Please bring to the forefront of our minds the mercy and grace you have shown to us and pass that mercy and grace on to others in line with your perfect will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Hopefully you can join us again next week for the next part of our Gospel for the Outcast sermon series. When God calls you home, may Jesus greet you with, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Thank you.